things are blowing up in industrial systems here in Germany this year. I had hoped that these things wouldn't happen, that this kind of future wouldn't be one that we are living in, but unfortunately it is. Um, and I hope that we can make that better, partly through the course of this talk, but more, I think, in the future with your help and your work. So I'm sorry to begin this presentation with such a, a dark thought, but um, this year's theme is a new dawn, and it's always darkest just before the dawn. So we're going to go through some of that uh, darkness in industrial systems and SCADA systems to get to a better place, right? Now, with that said, no hacker really gets to be where they are without the help of others, right? We stand on the shoulders of giants, and part of the key is not stepping on their toes on the way up. So I would like to say thank you to a bunch of people who are here, and also some people who aren't here, particularly the Oslo hackerspace where I hang out. And these people have taught me a lot of things, not just about technology, but about life, and um, on Aprendo, which is how Goya signed some of his last paintings and sketches, which basically means I'm still learning. Okay. So with that said, I hope that you will enjoy this talk um, with its darkness and its humor all at the same time. I used to be in circus, as you may have guessed from the mustache. Um, so I encourage you not just to view this as a technical vulnerability presentation, but also as kind of live technical stand-up comedy. Instead of jokes, we have vulnerabilities, and I hope that you will enjoy them. So these vulnerabilities are um, in switches. I chose to focus on switches, and that will become clear throughout the presentation, uh, why I chose to do that for industrial systems. Um, and we are looking primarily at three different families of switches, because I don't want to pick on any one vendor. In fact, the whole idea of this talk is to continue giving it. I have two other colleagues who couldn't be here with me today who have some vulnerabilities and some other switches and they look forward to presenting those vulnerabilities as part of this presentation in the future. So every time we give this presentation, we like to give some new vulnerabilities and show that this is systemic and endemic risk. So the, the three switches we'll be looking at today are the Siemens Scalance family, the GE Multilin family, and the Garrett Com Magnum family. These switches are usually not very big. They might be eight ports, they might be 24 ports, um, and they're used in a variety of different locations. So this talk is for you if you work in a utility, um, if you test industrial Ethernet switches, if you manage industrial Ethernet networking, if you're comfortable at a Linux command line and you play with web apps, but you don't know as much about reverse engineering, don't worry, I'm exactly the same. I suck at reverse engineering. Um, but I care about this stuff, and so I'm learning. If you are a developer of firmware, then I think this talk is for you as well. Um, I hope you learn something from it. If you like vulnerabilities, you'll enjoy this quite a lot. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you a little collection I have. You know, some people collect stamps or um, stories or jokes. I collect private keys, and I like to share them with other enthusiasts such as yourself. If you happen to work for one of the switch manufacturers, you know I've spoken to you before. Some of you I get on with very well. We speak regularly. Um, some of you, not yet, but uh, I hope you'll come and have a chat with me later. Okay, most SCADA or ICS presentations go a bit like this. Pwn the PLC, the RTU, the HMI. These are you know, terms that all of us in SCADA know. Maybe most of you know them by now. They're pretty popular. I hope you do. But programmable logic controller, remote terminal unit, or human machine interface. And the basic idea of the presentation is, if I pwn these things, game over. Physical damage, I win, isn't the world a scary place? And I encourage you to demand better content. I certainly grew up with better content. I used to go and see the presentations and the talks of a guy called Jason Larson. And he has a fantastic example of this. I want all of you to try it right now. Just think about, if you had complete control over a paint factory, what would you do to damage it? No one's going to get hurt. Everything's safe. It's a thought experiment, right? What would you do to damage it? 
Most people can't answer this question. And on certain types of processes, I can't answer this question. But other types I've worked with before, and I can answer this question, and I encourage you to, to ask it. But if you like, and you want to learn more, go and see Marmusha's talk. I think it's tomorrow. Um, think of my talk as a frame for her talk. She's going to be talking about how to damage a chemical process and what you need to do as an engineer to do that. And the reason she's doing that is to build a better process in the future. You have to break a few things to make them work a little bit better. Okay, so what's the point in industrial control system security? It's not credit card data. It's not privacy. No disrespect to my privacy friends in the room, I have the deepest uh, love and respect for the work that you do. But confidentially, confidentiality is the lowest um, priority for us in industrial systems. It would go availability, integrity, uh, confidentiality. And you might even swap integrity and availability in many cases. So you have to protect the sensor data or the control signals. Everything else is maybe a vulnerability on the path to getting this, but it's not the most important thing that we're trying to protect. So that's why I'm attacking switches. That's where the process is, right? Now, these may not be core switches. They're often um, a little bit further down in the chain. They're field devices, right? So you might find them in any of these locations. And this last example is um, not necessarily important because oil and gas is important, but it's important because it gives you the general format of all industrial systems. You have sensor network, and sensor data is traveling back and forth, and you have control signal data. That's it, basically. You might have different control signals on different protocols, and you might have different sensors on different protocols, giving you different values like pressure or heat or whatever, but most processes follow basically this format. Okay, I don't do SCADA 101. There are other people who do this. I'm trying to do a little bit to set the uh, reference for this talk, um, but usually I avoid it. So basically there's not much authentication or integrity in industrial systems protocols. There's not much cryptography. You would expect there to be, maybe. I'm continually surprised that I don't find any, and when I do find it, it's badly implemented and barely works. So once you have compromised a switch or another part of the network, you can perform man-in-the-middle attacks on the process, or you can create malicious firmwares on these different switches. And that's what I'm trying to prevent. I'm trying to find some of the different methods that people can use to produce these firmwares uh, and then get the vendors to fix them, right? Okay. These are some of the protocols. If you are new to this space, if you want to do some more work in this area but you don't know what to work on, take a picture of this slide or go and find it later and choose one of these protocols and go and work on it. We need people to go to these different organizations. Some of them are proprietary, some of them are open, and complain that there is not enough cryptography going on in this space. And yes, you can use VPNs, but believe me, I often don't find them. Okay. These are the switches, the specific versions of the firmware, in case you're here for vulnerabilities instead of just me waffling on about the basics. Um, if you want to go and look these up, uh, if you're a penetration tester working in this space, you can go and find them uh, all online. And you can get a feeling for the kind of coding practices that go into these different devices. Now, I've tried to choose the vulnerabilities that I'm presenting very carefully to take you gently from web app vulnerabilities into uh, a little bit deeper into the firmware. So the first one we'll be looking at is Siemens. And again, I'm not picking on any particular vendor. In fact, I'm very proud of Siemens. They're probably here again. They're here many years. Um, and they fixed these vulnerabilities within three months. And I think that was awesome, especially in the space that I work in. The average patch time in SCADA and ICS is 18 months. So I think Siemens deserves a round of applause for getting these fixed. So, without further ado, let's have some fun, right? So, MD5, you go to this web page for the switch. This is the management page of a switch, right? And you, 
interact with this web page and you have a look at it, and on the client side, they do MD5 of the password. Okay, that's fascinating. <laughs> I don't think that's particularly secure, um, but it's done in roughly the same format as that Linux command. So I use the Linux command instead of the JavaScript just to make it easier for everyone. You have the username at the beginning, and the password is in the middle, and then you have this nonce that's at the end, a number you use once, right? Um, I was surprised to see the nonce, and it's even called a nonce, right? So somebody had done a little bit of homework on their cryptography, and they understood that they wanted to use you know, this number used once to prevent replay of the hash every time. Okay, that's some pretty good work. Unfortunately, this is MD5, and this is protecting your electric utilities and your water and your sewage systems. <laughs> and um, you can brute force this in a few seconds uh, if the passwords are less than eight characters. And if they're around 15, it might take you 20 minutes or something, right? You can do this from PCAPs, from network traffic captures, and then you have the clear text password that you can use forever after with that switch. So off to a bad start, in my opinion. So these are the nonces that we're looking at. I'm glad to hear you laughing. It makes me, it warms the heart, right? Um, so you can see that they are incrementing and that they are hex. Um, yeah. What else can you say about this? <laughs> the last half is different than the first half. Um, not only is it incrementing, it is sequential if you pull them quickly enough. For those of you who also do a bit of reverse engineering, you might recognize the first half as well. Anybody in the room see any patterns in the first half of the, of the nonces? No? Hmm? Very good, IP address. MAC address would have been a good guess as well. I thought it was at first, and I got very confused when I went to look for the IP address, because I went to the switch itself, and the switch's IP address was not this in hex. It's the client-side address which I just, I couldn't believe, right? Like, it seems sort of, it makes a sort of sense if you're trying to keep session IDs in state, and it's like, oh, I want a different session for every IP address, and then I'll just use time. I'll use uptime uh, in hex as the rest of my session ID, right? You know, the entire IP space and uh, time, that can't be brute forced. It has a kind of crazy logic to it, right? Um, unfortunately, it can be, and uh, you can get the uptime from the device using SNMP. And of course, if you don't want to use SNMP, you can get old school and um, use the TCP sequence ID numbers. So not a lot of entropy there, I guess, I would say. And I think their lawyers agreed when they put out the, uh, the comments on this. All right, not only can you perform session hijacking, and if you are attacking switches, I'd like to point out that session hijacking is not necessarily a great attack in this environment. Think about it like you would at home, right? How often do you log into your router? In fact, even more importantly, how often do you upgrade the firmware on your router? Everyone who's upgraded the firmware on their router ever, raise your hand, just for an experiment. Thank goodness, right? But wait, keep them up just for a minute. Everybody who's updated it this year, keep your hand up. Everybody else put them down. Everybody who's updated it in the last six months, Okay, so that gives you a sense of how long these vulnerabilities can be in play on an industrial systems environment if you multiply that by about 10, right? Okay, so you can simply upload a firmware image to a Siemens Scalance device with this version number without authentication. You just need to know the URL. Cross-site um, uh, request forgery, right? I just say CSRF all the time. I don't even remember what it stands for. Um, so you can upload, a, or you can download a log file. Not that useful, but you get a sense of what's going on on the switch. You know what usernames might be present or whatever. Incidentally, all of these switches by default, uh, or at least this one, only have two usernames, right? So it's um, admin and operator, I think, on this switch. Or maybe it's not. But anyways, there's two usernames. Um, admin and manager? I don't know. I get them mixed up now. Um, but the configuration includes password hashes. I'm actually not even entirely convinced they're hashes, because when you increase the length of your password, it increases. But I'll leave that for future researchers to examine. 
um, you can download the firmware image from the device, which is nice. So you just make a request. You just post an HTTP request to this device, and it gives you the firmware that it is running back. That's not that big a deal, right? Because you're just viewing data on the switch. Um, but you can upload firmware <laughs> and configuration to this device, um, which is an authentication bypass in and of itself. But it's also interesting because I can take a configuration file from one of the devices that I have at home with a known password. I can upload a new configuration file with a password that I know. I can use the device to do whatever I want to do. And later, I can re-upload the old configuration file that I got from the device so no one ever even realizes uh, what's been changed. Right? So I think that's a disappointing state of affairs. And I wrote a script to do this so that you wouldn't have to when you are doing penetration tests of these devices. Um, and I gave you a little ASCII menu, because sometimes I get bored. You know? Cambridge is a small town. There's not much to do in the evenings. So feel free to go and examine my uh, GitHub repository where I put up some of this stuff. Uh, I'm Black Swanburst on GitHub and on Twitter. So like I say, Siemens are some of my favorite people. So I'm, I'm going to finish up with them. This is old day, if you like, all that you have just seen. Um, but I want you to keep in mind that these vulnerabilities will still be present in the wild for another two or three years. And I encourage you to go and uh, have a look at your systems if you have any of these devices um, and check them out and upgrade the firmware. I also hope this encourages you that if you haven't done much in industrial systems in SCADA, you don't have to be intimidated by all of the engineering and the terminology and the verbiage. There is plenty for any of you in this room to do in the industrial system space. You need to spend a little time speaking to engineers and translating your vulnerabilities into something meaningful for them. Um, but that's just a matter of spending more time with them and getting to know them. And I think that's valuable too, because they have a lot of experience. They care very deeply about safety, and I've learned quite a lot of things from engineers. Um, my general point here is I'd like you to stop defending banks and websites and other stuff we need your help in industrial systems, in utilities. We could really do with living in a safer world rather than one where you were just protecting other people's money. So we're going to move on to the GE Multilin line. Uh, I worked on a GE ML800, but these vulnerabilities affect seven of the nine switches in this family. Um, seven because one of the other switches is an unmanaged switch. Uh, if you're a hardware person, maybe you want to go and play around with those, but uh, not so much my thing. Uh, and the other one uses a different firmware image, but seven of the, the nine switches use a similar firmware image. GE offers a worldwide 10-year warranty. So let's see if that includes fixing vulnerabilities. I think it should. What do you think? No? A couple no's, a couple yeses? No? Undecided. All right. CCC is undecided on something. That's novel. Let's start with some new vulnerabilities. Cross-site scripting. Reflected, I grant you, but still cross-site scripting. And I want you to pay attention to the details. I'm not going to go slow for you. I'm going to ask you to think. I know it's morning. I know it's tough, but I am going to ask you to think. See Flash up there? Flash PHP in the third one? Yes, it runs Flash in your browser. So if you know something about Flash, Come and have a look at this switch sometime. <laughs> um, I didn't go for active script you know, attacks. There are so many attack surfaces on this device, I, just, I sometimes don't even know how I'm going to finish looking at all of them. Um, so I just worked with the web interface to begin with. right? So you have this cross-site scripting times eight. And I want you to notice in the last section there, arbitrarily supply, supplied uh, URL parameters. I don't know about you, but I, I think that's funny. right? You can just make up parameters to stick your cross-site scripting in. <laughs> it's unbelievable, right? Yeah. Anyways, what does that look like? It looks like that. They have an error data page. And OK, maybe I'm using a browser that they don't approve or something. But you know, it deserves looking at. Um, and you can do quite a lot of things with JavaScript on the client side these days. <sighs> Disturbing. Anyways, I'm not a big fan of XSS, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to things that I think are worth uh, my time. So if you fetch the initial web page of this switch, before you've even logged in, 
you get this config. So this is pre-authentication, no authentication, right? Now keep in mind that these switches are designed for process data, right? It's not carrying traffic to images of cats. It's supposed to be for engineering. So what happens if I add a no cache parameter and I make it, say, 500,000 digits long? I should just be able to crash the web server, right? Maybe, maybe. But you would not expect it to reboot the switch. And it takes you know, a minute or so for the switch to, be, to reboot, which is actually really impressive. It comes up pretty quickly. But um, you know, obviously, you can repeat this. So I wanted to examine that a lot further. I wanted to know more about that, that crash, what was rebooting the switch. Um, but like I say, I'm not a very good reverse engineer, so you're going to go on a little journey with me where I learned a couple things about reverse engineering. Um, and I had to change my approach from looking at the web app style volumes to moving into this uh, other stuff. So why is, a, why is a DOS even interesting? You'll remember that I mentioned Marmusha's talk. So the reason I mentioned her talk, this is it, right? Denial of service on a website, who cares? It's tearing posters down, as, as XKCD once uh, famously uh, explained to us. But in the industrial systems environment, it's very different. It can be very serious, right? A simplistic example is you have an application that has a heartbeat, and if you stop that heartbeat, it might go into some sort of safety state. It might, for example, scram a reactor. There is a famous uh, denial of service on PLCs that did scram a reactor in real life. Does anybody know what H2S is? Any oil and gas engineers in the room? Okay. So H2S alerts not reaching their destinations is pretty serious business, right? Um, for those of you who are not aware of H2S, it's a byproduct of producing oil and gas. And inhaled in very, very small amounts, you can go unconscious. And in sort of larger amounts, respiratory failure. So if you take safety seriously, if you ever work on these uh, rigs in these environments, you learn to care about the windsock. Right? One of these alerts goes out, an alarm goes off. There are many different alarms. You have to memorize how they all sound on a, on a rig and then react to them. And when you hear the H2S alert, you look up at the windsock to keep an eye on where the wind is and try and avoid being downwind of wherever the leak is. So a simple denial of service that we would not care about in a web application environment in this environment can be very serious. I'm not saying it always is. It just can be, right? So denial of service goes up in our list of uh, problems, especially when we're looking at networking devices. OK, so that's, uh, that's it for the denial of service. But like I say, we're going to look at some other stuff. In fact, the story with this switch began with a concerned citizen. About um, three or four years ago, I found 10,000 industrial systems on the internet as part of my master's thesis. And I was pretty uncomfortable with that. So I sent that data to various computer emergency response teams around the world. Um, I believe it was 52 of them, right? Not all of them were critical infrastructure, a lot of them were small stuff, but maybe one in 100, I was told, uh, or in one particular country when they got back to me, one in 20 uh, were considered critical infrastructure. And after that, you have a sort of reputation among the computer emergency response teams of the world. So people send you stuff. You get anonymous emails from someone called Concerned Citizen. Thank you very much. Um, they sent me a firmware upgrade PCAP of this particular device. I suspect that they worked at one of the utilities, and they wanted me to see how upgrading the firmware of this GE switch was performed. So it all began with a PCAP. So I ran TCP trace to carve out all the files and see what was going on. And you could see instantly that there was an FTP session. Um, later, looking at the switch, I see that you can also upgrade them over TFTP. Um, so the management of the switch happens in HTTPS and is encrypted, but the firmware upload goes across FTP, right? So you can just carve the file out. <laughs> A little bit of network forensics, I guess. Um, so instantly I could see that this one is complete, and the ports on the end of the numbers give me a clue of what's going on. It's a larger stream. This one seems interesting. Let's have a look at it. So 
I tried running File and Binwalk. I don't know about you, but I believe that hacking is a, a journey of understanding. In fact, hacking is understanding a system better than it understands itself and nudging it to do what you want, right? Um, and I also feel that I should understand my tools. I don't really understand my tools until I know where they're going to fail me, or they have failed me in the past. In this particular case, I think Benwalk is a fantastic tool and File is a fantastic tool, but they didn't tell me anything. And that was a, that was a journey of discovery for me, so that was nice. It was like, okay, Benwalk doesn't always give me everything. I think I was running an older version, and I think it would handle it now. But the point is, after Benwalk didn't give me anything, just resort to the old school stuff, right? Go strings. And I found these deflate and inflate copyright strings, and I could tell that a certain portion of the file was compressed. So this is just from the PCAP. Remember this whole story. So I tried to deflate the whole thing. That didn't work. Um, again, I just did something simple, right? Get a Python script that checks every byte to see which parts of the file don't produce zlib errors when you try and, try and uh, decompress them. And you figure out what sectors of this file are compressed. So you go to your friend DD, and you carve out this section of the file, right? So we have this larger firmware image with this little compressed section, and we have now cut this little compressed section out. Um, I suppose I could have loaded this up into Python and used zlib to decompress it, but at the time I was still trying to use command line tools, and someone said, oh, just concatenate the gzip bytes on it, you know, um, gzip inherits from uh, inflate and deflate, so if you just concatenate the bytes, it should still handle it. So I did that, and I got a decompressed binary. You know, when you ran strings on that, it started to make a lot more sense, and you could find opcodes in it, where previously it didn't make any sense at all. So once you've got an image like that, what do you do? Well, if you're me, you just grep for bugs. I think I learned that from Ilya, if he's here in the room. Thank you, Ilya. You know, thank you very much. Ilya said, I, I asked him like a year or two ago, how do you, um, how do you find so many bugs? <laughs> and he said, oh, I just, you know, I grep for them. I use find. <laughs> And so I started thinking about firmware images. And like, if I was going to grab for a bug in a firmware image, what would it be? And my answer is hard-coded credentials and default keys, because you find them every single time. So I have this command aliased on my machine, and I just grab for it, and I find private keys. And this is how you, too, can end up with a private key collection. So there you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, they're hard-coded keys, but what are they for? It doesn't stop there. You know you've got the keys, but what do they do, right? Um, that was the next step of the journey for me, two of them. Um, you can see one's encrypted with a password. We'll come back to that one later. Let's start with the one on the left. If you load this key up into Wireshark, and you use it to decrypt the SSL, you have a self-decrypting PCAP. Remember at the beginning, it was using HTTPS to manage the device and upload this firmware image. So if you happen to have this firmware image, you can decrypt all the traffic. No forward secrecy, right? Now, you don't have to be lucky and have concerned citizens send you an email. You can download this image from the GE website. And you can carve the keys out of the image in the same way that I did and decrypt the SSL traffic of any PCAP that is sent to you. Now, the passwords underneath that are in clear text. You can see them highlighted down here, password manager and user manager. Um, you can see them up there as well, and you can see that we've decrypted the SSL with that key. So default keys, right? Is it a big deal? I believe the vendors in this case say you can upload your own key to the device. Um, for those of you who aren't used to working in embedded, sometimes it's difficult to generate a key on the device because you don't have enough memory, or you don't have enough entropy, or you don't have enough processing power. That's the usual excuses. Um, and they're, they're true. I shouldn't say excuses. Those, those things are true. But you could, of course, generate it on the client side and upload it to the device. And that's what they allow you to do with this switch, which is great. But where is your encrypted channel in which to upload this key? 
<laughs> so you can use the serial device and uh, make sure visually that there's no man in the middle. But if you're doing this remotely, and I'd like you to keep in mind that most substations are remote, if anyone here works in a utility, are you going to drive to every substation and plug in a serial cable <laughs> to change the keys on all these devices? It's the sort of thing you need to know in advance, right? So the problem with key management, particularly uh, with SSL and the industrial systems environment, is that you have to manage the keys. And these particular keys are self, well, the certificates are self-signed. So you can't revoke them. And besides, industrial systems are never connected to the internet, right? So it wouldn't have made any difference. So these are the kind of problems we're dealing with in this space, and that's why I'm trying to encourage you, whether you do crypto or privacy or whatever, spend a little time in the embedded space, just for a bit. There's plenty of easy work. Okay, so what about the second key? It requires a password. I didn't feel like brute forcing it. Maybe you do, I don't know. Um, I tried all the strings in the image, a classic technique, right, just in case someone had a hard-coded the password. I mean, the hard-coded credentials were there, but not the hard-coded password. So I guess I got to start reversing, and as I previously said, I suck at reversing. Um, that's why I come to CCC, so I can learn, right? Um, but I did find this PowerPC ROM image. And I think it's running ECOS and Red Boot. And I haven't even gotten down to doing hardware stuff, taking it apart, having a look at it. But I probably will in the future. So there's the image. I'm slowly starting to learn my way around and figure out what's going on. So I had a look at the, the image, and I figured out that this key is used for SSH, right? Like, well, it would be the other encrypted thing. But I, I couldn't enable SSH on the device. I, get, I try and enable SSH on the device. And I'm logged in as manager, by the way, which is the highest level user on this particular device. And I put in the passwords that I know and a bunch of other passwords, and, and they don't work. Like I said, I tried all the strings in the image. So apparently, to enable SSH, I need a password for something. Now, maybe I'm just misunderstanding or I, I'm not so clear on what's going on, but I don't know about you, I kind of feel like if I buy a device that's supposed to be used for a safety-critical process, I should be allowed to use SSH without having to call up the vendor and get some special magic password. So, considering I don't like that approach, um, what if I patch my own key into the image, right? I don't know the password of their key, but I know the password of a key I can generate. So I just need to make sure it's roughly the right size and try and patch it in. Um, then I've got some problems with compression because I've got to reverse the whole process that I just described to you, patch it into the larger binary. Will there be any CRCs or firmware signing? I don't know, right? So the uploaded image is not a valid image for this device. That's correct. I messed with it. <laughs> but I got this error. And it gave me a clue. It gave me a clue that I did indeed have some of my CRCs wrong. So when I altered the image again, I got to this state. So you're learning all the time by having a real device. Now, some of my friends, they do static analysis, and they don't buy these devices. Um, I decided to buy this one. I found one on eBay. It wasn't very expensive. So I mean, it depends on your range for expensive. But if you're helping defend industrial systems, um, I thought it was worth the money. So I bought it. And this enables me to try firmware images out, right? And I can slowly start to figure out what I need to patch on these firmware images to do whatever I want. Um, luckily, I just tried to patch mine to have SSH, because I thought people deserve to have SSH. Um, so that's an Adler 32 up there on the left. And the other CRC is on the bottom. So that Adler 32 and some uh, adjustment of file length, all those zeros in that line just above it, um, eventually got me to the point where it believes it's a corrupted binary. And then we have this CRC on the end that we need to have a look at. Now, I'm a big fan of suspense. I love suspense. So I'm going to leave that one as a cliffhanger and an exercise for you watching. So I said I was going to talk about GE ML800, but I'm also going to talk about Garrettcom. Luckily, it's not very difficult. Garrettcom is the original equipment manufacturer for the GE ML800 er, series. Um, I noticed that because the certificate I found attached to those private keys said Garrettcom in it. And I went and looked at their firmware images, and they have similar CRCs, similar file structures, similar everything. So I believe that they are affected by the cross-site scripting, the denial of service, and hard-coded keys. 
Um, I understand from some people that they have been in contact with GE to try and fix some of this stuff, but their uh, response to GE was mainly, sorry, this is the end of life on this device. That's fine, I understand you're running a business, but you're selling equipment to people who manage utilities that we all depend on. You know, if Sony goes bankrupt because they get hacked, that's one thing, right? But you, you can't just dissolve a utility and start again. As my friend Klaus points out regularly, fantastic insights into the industrial system world, Klaus and Vanessa. You can't just dissolve the utility and start again. You still have the same infrastructure, you still have the same workers. It doesn't work that way. You can't bail out utilities that we depend on. So, sorry, end of life. I don't, I don't even understand why people buy these devices and this code without code escrow. You know, when you buy the code, make sure you have the code in perpetuity for these systems so that you can fix them when something like this or something worse happens. If I'm your worst nightmare, <laughs> you have real problems because there are very dark people in the world actually damaging furnaces in Germany. So if me disclosing keys on stage is scary for you, you need to get a grip. So Garrett Com, here's your key too. The strings come from the images. Developers are funny people, really. I like those. Um, I just put them up because they're funny, right? Some people had some hard times, I guess, writing some of this code. And my respect to them, they do, they do great work, but you know, there's a couple things we can improve on security in these devices. So I once had the opportunity to stand in front of six different vendors at the same time, their computer emergency response teams at a conference, and I said to them, will any of you commit to an average patch time for vulnerabilities of three months? An average patch time, because it might take eight months, as it so far has taken in the case of GE and Garcom to work on these issues. It might take a long time in some cases, but as an average patch time, I think three months for things that we all depend on is reasonable. So I asked these six different teams in the same room if any of them would commit to this. And I heard silence for 30 seconds. So my friend decided to call this the silence of the vendors, right? And I think that's, that sums it up. Um, I'd like to see better patch times. I'd like to see computer emergency response teams in each of these vendors, and I'd like to see someone responsible for security in each of these different utilities. <sighs> I can dream, right? Um, I think that key management, the current practice in industrial systems is to take some insecure protocol and wrap it in SSL or TLS, which is why we need the help of you privacy people, um, because TLS and SSL are not the be all and end all. Um, they often sort of go the wrong way, right? For example, you can use TLS to do um, integrity without encryption. So you can verify that every message has reached its destination intact, but it is not encrypted. And this means that you can still do um, intrusion detec detection analysis of the packets, right? That's really good. But nobody uses that in SSL in other ways, right? I'm a big fan of Shodan. I use Shodan for a variety of different things, usually to get a sense of the internet as a whole, right? When, uh, let me back up a little bit. When I was at uh, Cambridge, I went to Darwin College. And because you're at Darwin College, you read up a bit on Darwin and you think about how Darwin thought. And um, I think the internet is kind of like that. You know, when it was built by the IETF and various people who did fantastic work, they imagined it one way. And then we inherited it and it grew and it became an ecosystem and stuff happens out there that you wouldn't expect. And so that's why I like Shodan. It's kind of like being a natural scientist. What's a survey of the world? What kind of machines are out there? What versions are they running? When do people update their SSL or you know, their um, certificates? Do they do it before or after the certificate is, is invalid? Um, do they always upgrade the algorithm? Do they increase the key size? You know, how do things change, right? You need to sort of study it as a whole. And that's my point when it comes to just taking SSL and slapping it over a protocol. It's not quite that simple. So again, we need your help. Where can we go with these attacks? And you remember at the beginning, I, I pointed out the underpants gnome. 
the emperor wears no clothes. Altering switch configurations is a big deal because you can exfiltrate process data. That gives you a map of the process because industrial systems are bespoke. Each one of them is different. It does run different traffic. And we are lucky to work on security in this space because our users are numerate and literate and they care about safety. They don't always understand security, but they do care about safety. So if you can make it a safety concern, they care. There are also engineers at many of these utilities who look at the network 24-7. Not all of them, but some of them. Can you imagine a home network or you know, something else with that kind of user base? We're lucky. We should be taking advantage of that user base. So getting back to the point, you know, denial of service attacks to disrupt a process. Go and see Marmusha's talk. This will all make a lot more sense when you go and see her talk. Basically, any man-in-the-middle attack can disrupt, alter, or drop traffic at this point, if you can affect the switches in the substation. And exfiltrating the data gives you a map of the process, which leads towards further potential damage for the utilities. Now, it's not always that simple. People will get up on stage and they will tell you, I am awesome, and this is how it's done, and it's easy to blow shit up. It's not true. It takes a little bit of thought, it takes a little bit of work. I am certainly not awesome. I am just a quality assurance person from a former vendor. I just decided to get into security and keep going with it, right? So, you can't always perform these man-in-the-middle attacks. People will say you can, but the reason you can is real-time system constraints. Some systems will stop receiving traffic five milliseconds or microseconds later and ignore anything. If a value doesn't arrive in this time, it doesn't care. So the idea that you can route the traffic out to some other country and then back in and disrupt the process is bollocks. Sometimes you have to alter the firmware to achieve that. Now, it depends on the process, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of how performing actual attacks give you an, a sense of what the limits are, what the logistical burdens are for the attacker, and that's important stuff for us to know. All right, a little bit of an overview. Drunk session IDs, brute forcing MD5 plus nonce, cross-site request forgery, forgery for firmware, <laughs> upload of all things. Reflect, reflected cross-site scripting, eight, eight cases of it. Pre-authentication denial of service. Hard-coded keys times two in a firmware image. SSL without forward secrecy. Self-signed certificates, so there's no revoking, there's no managing of the keys on these devices, right? Not to mention utility workers are busy already. They, they may not have time to manage all of these devices. We might need to rethink that approach, right? Clear text passwords under SSL, because, well, no one can break SSL unless you hard code the key in the firmware that's downloadable from the internet. Uh, enable SSH with a password and three quarter of a year waiting for fixes for some of this stuff. I'm not happy with that. I think that we could live in a much better, much safer world. And to do so, we need to talk very seriously about some of these issues. Don't take my opinion for it. Listen to some other people. The best thing about doing industrial systems work is the diversity of approach, you know? I love that there are so many other people doing SCADA and ICS, and I love that they're going different directions. So, in the future, I plan to be on another stage with some friends and uh, show you some more. Thank you for listening, mustache fans. And as a parting thought, more tax money is spent on surveillance than on defending common utilities. Well, thank you. You thank made you. me a scary Sunday morning. <laughs> they got a utility down the road. Um, okay. Uh, we'll have some questions taken. Please, um, as the session is recorded and streamed, anything you say, say it into a mic. Any questions up? Wow, it is Sunday morning. <laughs> Number right? three, sure. Everybody yeah. understood everything? Okay. You're kidding okay. me. Okay. We've got one right here. There's a question. Hey, thanks. I enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. And I think it's very important uh, to raise awareness, uh, but uh, I think it's not to raise awareness, uh, not much in this community, but in the, within the engineering community. And I see it a lot of times. 
And many engineers having lots of problems doing that for several reasons. There is maybe the, the engineer who is thinking about this, but has its managers in the back, has to deal with service personnel, which know how to work a hammer and a screwdriver. <laughs> Uh, on the other side, uh, engineers have to work with customers, which are more those lazy <laughs> people. And so that's how these things happen. And I think it's more important to raise awareness of, of these kind of things in, in the engineering community. Mm -hmm. So just to repeat a little bit for anybody else that couldn't hear it or for the recording, um, it's very important to work with engineers. Some of the engineers understand the problem, but typically management or lower level service uh, personnel don't always understand the problem. Um, and it's not so important to raise the awareness in the hacker community, but, but more with the engineers is what you, what you were saying. Right. Okay. Absolutely true. Completely agree with you. Um, I don't just come to these conferences and present to you guys. Uh, I go and I present to the engineers too. And in fact, a couple of engineers have come to this conference because we did work at other conferences um, to see what the hacker community is about and learn things from the hacker community because this is a place where you can learn if you're just not afraid of getting pwned a couple times, right? Um, and it happens to me too, right? I learn a lot from getting you know, compromised on my machine and watching someone do something. Anyways, back to the point. I don't just work with engineers or hackers. I also work with C-level executives. So I'm on a sabbatical from IOActive at the moment at the Cambridge Center for Risk Studies. And I'm working with the insurance people, which has its challenges, shall we say. Um, but some of them are very intelligent people. And they want to understand what's going on with hacking attacks. And they want to approach this from a slightly different angle. Um, my stake in that is to be sure that when the insurance people do get involved, that they actually ask for fixes and improve stuff. So yes, I do my best to raise awareness wherever I can, um, and I'm not alone. You can help me. Thank you. Okay, there's another question okay. over up, here. Oh, okay. Number two. Oh, Number two. Oh, and up there too. Yes, we saw you. Okay, number two was first, I think. Go ahead. Uh, Hannes Trofenig. So you mentioned a couple of things in, in, or a couple of vulnerabilities, and I was wondering uh, what you would think an ideal system would look like. You mentioned uh, key provisioning, mm -hmm. and of course putting uh, certificates. I assume that they were different certificates for different devices rather than the same certificate for all devices. Okay, that's a uh, bad thing. Um, and, and also... Um, sort of the way how the software update uh, management works. So how, how would you, uh, if you could give them some advice how to design the system, how would you do it? Okay, so um, first of all, I wouldn't hard code the keys as you, as you discussed um, to be in every device the same. Um, it's one thing to put in your documentation, hey, you should update the keys. But I mean, if I can patch a binary file with a key, then there's no reason you couldn't do that on the website where you download uh, the firmware image, right? Just as an example, as a thought experiment. So to make that clear, the, the upgrade path for these devices is download the firmware image from the website to some machine, and then you know carry it, because all these systems are air gap, to some other location, and then upload it onto the switch, right? with hard-coded credentials. So first off, whenever you provision a switch initially, you provision all of the credentials for that device. That's standard practice on many routers and, and other pieces of equipment today. Um, and I would think less about defending and securing the device than on being able to regularly check its integrity, the integrity of the firmware that it's running and the integrity of the configuration. So um, I'd focus on that. And I'd focus on being able to recover the switch after it's been attacked. So you reverse your thinking. You assume that one day someone's going to crack your firmware signing and crack this and crack that. And you focus on, how can I quickly upload a new firmware image that is known to be good and verify that the one that is uploaded is good to this device? Thank you. The, thank you. There was a question up there on the balcony. Yes, we have two questions here on the net. The first one is, how would you solve the end of line uh, sorry, end of life issue. Sometimes product lines just get really outdated. That's absolutely true. And it is slightly unfair of me to be hard on the vendors, but it's my job to tink, take the debate a little bit too far the other way, right? So, how would I solve the end of life issue? Was the question from the internet. 
I don't know. I think that's not a technical problem. It's a societal problem. Like, when we buy bridges, they're bridges until they fall down. <laughs> when we buy um, roads, they stay there until they go away. I mean, there's probably some end-of-life issues in there, but it's almost more of a contractual legal issue, and someone should study that. There are people studying that, but it's not my area of expertise. But I'll try and answer as best I can. I think code scroll is a good way to go. When you buy some of these devices, you say, I want the code for this device in the future. I want to have access to it. If your company goes bankrupt, I need you to give up the source code for these devices when you go bankrupt or when you disappear or when it's end of life. There are a couple manufacturers out there doing open source switches. There's a company called Open Gear who are awesome. They gave me a switch to play with that I haven't had time to look at yet. I'm, I think that's amazing, right? And their code is open source and you can go and examine it. So you would have the code anyway. Those are two different approaches, right? I think there are others. You can solve this problem technically or legally or socially, but as a society, we depend on these utilities. And that code should not just vanish when it's um, difficult or costly to keep it upgraded. There was a second question from the internet. Yes. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, the second one is, what should a non-technical person in respect of uh, the computing side, non-technical person, that manage a small town utility do as best practice? I think the first and most important thing is to look for attacks. I'm sorry, I should probably repeat that question just to be sure. What should someone in a small town who manages a utility do to defend themselves and protect themselves? So the first thing is look for attacks. Even if you spend a few hours a week looking for something, you script something up or you hire some college kid to come in and script something and look for things on your network and ask questions. And yes, they're going to be a pain in the ass and it's going to be difficult, but you're going to learn things about your network and you might detect some attacks. So the first problem in utilities is no one is responsible for security. It's not my job is kind of the mantra. So for a small utility, find someone whose job it is. If you're a very small utility, there's probably some other small utilities near you, and you can hire a resource together to come and visit your different utilities and help you out. The second one is watch your relationship with your vendor. When you purchase this equipment, you spend a lot of money on it. Spend a little bit of time doing penetration tests. Yes, I like it when you hire me, but you don't have to hire me. There are plenty of other people you can hire who will have a look at the device and find the simple vulnerabilities. So when you purchase something, make sure you test it for security purposes. And that's very important because you can even put into your contract, if you fail these security tests, we will pay you less money. And the vendors are not going to react to security until you do that. So that's the second answer. And um, I wish I had a third to make it very neat, but I don't. Okay, there was one more question at mic four, I think. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for your talk. Talk into the mic, please. Thank you for your talk. Thank uh, you. Hi. Um, I'm kind of a newbie to the uh, C3 community, and I, I'm not sure about the question I want to ask you. Um, pr probably many people understand in this room, but I don't. And therefore, I would like to ask you, what exactly do you mean by arbitrary firmware? Ah. What, uh, no problem. Um, so the question was, what do you mean by arbitrary firmware? I mean, um, firmware that I have altered that was not manufactured by the vendor to do whatever I want. How do you trust that this switch sends all the packets that it should send? What if it, uh, you know, one of my, my handle is BSB, right? What if it drops every packet that has BSB in the packet, right? You can rewrite a firmware image to do whatever the device can do. And in some cases, more things than the device usually does to damage itself, for example. So an arbitrary firmware is one in which anyone writes the firmware and there's no checking to be sure that this is the image that you want on this device, whether it's provided by the vendor or the community, right? You still want checking that this is the correct code uh, or the code that you want it anyway, right? Okay, thank you. Is that a question here, Mike? One, okay, go ahead. Yes, please. Um, in, your in your hypothetical question, you, you asked uh, what uh, damage could I do in, in a paint factory? Mm -hmm. But you can also reverse it. What kind of company secrets mm -hmm. can I ob obtain? Uh, for, uh, for example, um, 
your favorite recipe for your cho hot chocolate or mm -hmm. uh, the recipes of Coca-Cola, they are uh, uh, vulnerable as well, aren't they? Yes. So the question, just again for everyone else, um, you don't just have to talk about damage in a paint factory or any industrial system. You can also talk about um, intellectual property and protecting the recipes that we use to bake cookies or make beer or whatever, pharmaceuticals, whatever. Um, and that's a fantastic question, and I'm glad you, glad you brought it up. Um, a couple years ago when I was doing, well, more than a couple years, like eight years ago when I was doing industrial system security, I realized I wasn't getting a lot of traction. It was before Stuxnet. I was a quality assurance guy. Everybody thought I was fucking crazy, right? Stuxnet, career. <laughs> It's wrong, it's really wrong. Um, but the point is, I tried to take that approach. I tried to say, you have uh, a process in which you manufacture something and you make money by the fact that that process is relatively secret. And if you don't care about defending your workers from being damaged, then at least care about the intellectual property because I'll get security in by some sort of back door, right? I'm a little bit of a security Machiavellian. I'll find a way to get security into these systems somehow. So I tried to say intellectual property, you should be protecting that. And I found that um, they didn't care so much. I mean, maybe you'll have more luck. Maybe post Stuxnet, that's a better argument. Uh, I hope you do. Um, but it is an important question as well, right? It's not, it's not just a potential for damage. I think there's a lot more espionage going on on these networks than there is damage and sabotage. Okay, we'll take one more question on mic four. Thank you. Okay, um, my question concerns um, the concepts of uh, software-defined networking and open flow. So when I first heard about software-defined networking, I thought, well, this is a huge security um, issue and there may be huge vulnerabilities. After your talk, I think this might actually be a good idea to dump down the switches and put the intelligence somewhere locked up in, in a safe place. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? Can I it actually improve security? Yeah. So the question is, um, what role could software-defined networking play in these sorts of environments? And is it a good idea from a security perspective? Um, Anytime someone has a revolution in computing, we also have to update our security paradigm. So I think with software-defined networking, it's not whether it's good or bad, it's that you defend that network differently than you defend uh, one of these networks. So it's not so much that it's good, it's good or bad, it's neutral. If you know how to defend your network, I don't care what it is, as long as someone's looking to defend it and cares about you know, how the flows are working. So I think software-defined networking in these environments could be a very good thing. But the refresh rate on these devices is not that high. So I don't think we'll see it there for a little while. Even though it might be a good thing philosophically, um, it takes 5, 10, 15, 20 years to refresh these networks. So it'll be a little while, right? But it's not good or bad. It's just learn to defend what you got is the problem, right? OK, thanks a lot. OK. OK, let's give a big hand for Aaron, and thank you. Thank you.